I'm very excited to be uh, doing this candidate showcase with Simon Wild today. Uh, and this is because Simon is a very experienced professional with more than 20 years of experience in the IT industry, working mostly as a business analyst, uh, a business analyst leader, and everything in between. Uh, Simon has extensive experience working in the public sector, working in the financial services industry, and in utilities. So uh, let's welcome Simon. Simon, welcome to the Candidate Showcase interview. Uh, I'm wondering if we can just get started off with you telling us a little bit about yourself. Hi, right, good morning, Mel. Uh, thanks, thanks for doing this. So, um, yeah, as you say, I've been uh, working in IT in both Canada and the UK for more than 20 years. Started out in a software house, um, selling uh, software to uh, retail stockbrokers in the UK, and uh, moved from there to professional services, freelanced for a few years, uh, moved to Canada and I've been working essentially in uh, the, the financial services and predominantly the fund space for the last 10 years. All right. Excellent. Excellent. Now, looking at your profile here, I can see that you have an extensive amount of experience uh, in, in, in industry. And uh, as a professional who has that kind of experience, you're inevitably going to be running into a lot of different ways of delivering software. And so Agile, as we know, is one way of delivering software. Waterfall is another one. Uh, I'm wondering if you can speak to us uh, a little bit about your experiences in uh, trying to implement Agile uh, in the organizations that you've worked in. Sure. Um, so implementing Agile, I think, is really dependent on the, uh, the, the experience and the team that you're working with on, in terms of how you approach it. Mm -hmm. um, one organization I worked in, Agile was kind of seen as a, a euphemism for being a cowboy. And uh, so try to steer away from using certain terminology to, to try and focus more on the benefits and um, efficiencies and getting value out and helping people understand that. So a lot of it in terms of implementing Agile has been about the communication part, making sure people are aware of the benefits. And I think that's true about implementing anything, even if it's a, a new piece of software. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So a different approach. Um, really trying to make sure that people are aware of you know we're trying to keep the communication lines open making sure everyone's involved everyone's aware um you know what, what's the benefit of getting a you know a minimal value proposition out as soon as possible what's the minimum viable product you know how can we get something out to you as value as soon as possible so that you're going to see the benefits of this straight away and then we can build on that um, and, and really kind of extolling the benefits of doing that kind of minimal implementation and then building on it. Now, yeah. um, I mentioned uh, combating the, the view that it's being uh, agile can be, can be seen as being a bit of a cowboyish behavior. Uh, what I mean by that is it can have a perception that um, you're trying to do something just quick without any care, just, just get something out there as quick as possible. My personal view and experience is that you can put as much rigor into Agile as you can in any other methodology. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it's really just down to how you structure it and work out what the bounds are, um, what the actual needs of the organization are. For example, if there's documentation needs, needs Agile doesn't mean you don't document anything. It's a very common talk. misconception. I'm glad to hear you say that. Yes, yes. It can mean you document it in a different way. That's right. Um, or, or use a different structure. For example, yeah. um, traditional business requirement documents may have long paragraphs of text. That's right. Um, one of the things that I like to do is to break that down into finite points um, using a user story structure. Yep, yep. To uh, really make it finite, something that you know, is easy to understand for both the stakeholders, the developers, something that's quantifiable for the QA team as well. Mm -hmm. um, and it also lends itself to, to um, uploading into things like JIRA, Team Foundation Server, so that you have that traceability of things as well. Yeah, and uh, I'm so glad to hear you say so many of the things that you've said because uh, much of the perception about going agile, I think, in the industry may be a little bit off of what practitioners see on the ground. 
And many leaders, many IT leaders even uh, in industry tend to have a very uh, overly optimistic perception of what Agile can do for them, or they tend to have uh, the idea that Agile is going to get them to do a lot more work uh, in a shorter period of time. I like the fact that you emphasize on the fact that the idea here is for us to get a minimum viable product out as soon as possible, which is really the, the, the main uh, purpose of going Agile. And I think it speaks to your experiences in industry uh, to know the fact that in many organizations, Agile can sometimes just be code for doing a chaotic way of of doing an implementation, very unorganized. And so a lot of people will put the Agile label on that. And it's good to see that you have the awareness as uh, an IT practitioner and as a leader, you have the awareness that these are some of the major pitfalls of going Agile. So that's, that's very great to see. Uh, I see also here in your profile that you have uh, experience establishing a BA Center of Excellence, which I, I think is uh, a very uh, large and beneficial thing that can uh, help organizations in a big way. I'm wondering if you can speak to us about some of your experiences is in, uh, in taking that on. Sure. Um, I mean, essentially, I would say that one of the reasons that drove me to, to do that was that the organization I was working in at the time when I joined had no deep understanding of what a business analysis team can do. Mm -hmm. And so part of it was about building awareness of what we as professionals are able to do and offer, you know, where's our value? How can we get that to the team? Right. And getting it out in a way that people could access it and see what was going on. Mm -hmm. So, Part of it was about increasing the visibility of the team. Part of it was about uh, increasing the capability of the team. Part of it was about putting in uh, pr processes and procedures. Now, when I say putting in processes and procedures, it's not a case of here's a template, you must fill out section A, B, and C in this way. It's more a case of here's a suite of tools that we have in our toolkit that could be used in different circumstances. You know, is it appropriate to use this type of UML diagram, for example? Or is it more appropriate to do uh, a slide deck? You know, who's the audience? And That's right. Putting in place things like regular weekly sessions for continuous development where the BAs would come together, we would get around a table, we would discuss a point, or there would be a particular learning. So getting a number of different things in place to help really strengthen the capability of the team and make sure that we're constantly building that. So one example would be uh, putting together a, a business requirements document. As I've mentioned before, I like to use user stories within them to say, hey, look, here's an example. Could this be applied to your projects? Um, and the other part of it as well that I have mentioned is ongoing coaching. Mm -hmm. So one-to-one -one sessions with individual BAs, perhaps if they needed specific help on a specific project or a specific tool, really to try and help hone their skills and, and make sure they have a stronger set of tools in their toolkit. Yeah. And what I really like about your approach to establishing this center of excellence is the fact that you're not really just applying a templated version of processes and procedures. What you're really encouraging your uh, team, your business analysis team to do, it seems like uh, as part of this initiative is to understand that they have a set of tools available to them but not all tools are appropriate for all types of challenges. And as part of being an analyst, uh, especially when you start to get into the intermediate and senior level, is really having a clear understanding of what tools are appropriate for what situation. So I really like the fact that you uh, take that approach where you're making a tool set available to them and really leaving it up to the analysts and guiding them through trying to determine what tools are the right fit for what situation. So that's a, that's a very important point there. Um, can you maybe give us a little bit more insights around the challenges uh, that uh, come with having to mentor more junior members of a team or uh, having team members who, uh, you know, a lot of times when you have different people on your team, you have uh, analysts that will have be at different levels of seniority. They will be at different uh, capability levels. Can you maybe just talk to us a little bit about some of the challenges of doing that type of mentorship with your team members? 
Sure. I mean, I would say that mentoring and coaching are very similar things, but they're not exactly the same. Mm -hmm. um, my approach is more around coaching. Um, and one of the first things that, that can be a challenge is if you're working with someone as a coach, they need to be coachable. Yeah. They need to be open to the coaching. Um, so a, a big challenge can be not trying to coach someone that's not willing to be coached. Correct. So really understanding your team. And it, I guess it's like with, with any project, even you mm -hmm. need to understand the stakeholders. You need to understand the people you're dealing with, understand the communication needs, um, really think about their needs and adapting what I do and how I approach them to, to their specific needs. Yeah. And that's, I think that individual style of, you know, trying to figure out what is a person's personality, what is their working style and, and working around that, I think is, is your approach to uh, managing and growing a, a, a team of business analysts. Um, so let's switch gears a little bit and talk about uh, some of the more practical aspects of actually uh, delivering solutions. So Product management is a role, it's an up and coming role that has gained a lot of popularity in the last couple of years. I'm wondering if you can speak to us about uh, some of your experiences managing different uh, products inside of uh, organizations, financial institutions, or uh, any of the other experiences that you've had. Sure. Uh, I would say a majority of the, the, the product work that I've done has been on regulatory products or products that sit within a regulatory framework. So. Um, for example, um, products which have taxable benefits, but in order to do that, they have to be structured in a certain way. Right. So most of my experience, again, would be around launching new products and bringing those into, into market in a new space and then continually developing them as we go. So, for example, one big project I did in the UK was launching something called the Individual Savings Account. Okay. And as well as defining all of the, the rules for that up front, making sure that they were delivered, we made sure we had the MVP or the, the, the minimal viable product launched in line for when the legislation kicked in. So we are actually able to um, facilitate one of our clients opening the very first one of these. Mm -hmm. But then looking at the, the backlog of other requirements, so building that list and maintaining it, prioritizing it so that we could get those subsequent releases out to the clients so that they had a, a more robust product, a, a more flexible product, uh, and then building that on, keeping in constant communication with them to understand the priorities. You know, the other delivery cycles we had as a software house, uh, what we had to do in terms of other regulatory deliverables, what resources were available, so that we could actually manage what resource was available against what the clients wanted so that we could get an effective release out to them. So continually developing those products uh, in a way that the, the client's going to see additional value coming to them uh, mm -hmm. regularly. Right, right. And building, uh, so the type of product you just described is a product where you basically have a set of clients that are external to your own organization that are going to be using that end product that you're building for them. Um, and as a product owner or a product manager many times, that is one scenario that you can be up against. But another major scenario that oftentimes gets overlooked when we're discussing product management and product ownership is the organization's uh, own internal product needs. So for example, you'll have an organization that needs to launch a new HR system. This HR system is exclusively for their own internal use. Can you talk to us maybe a little bit about the uh, differences in the role of the product manager for external products versus internal products and uh, with some of the challenges that each of them might have? Sure. I mean, I would actually say that there's a lot of similarities between the two and uh, I wouldn't tend to draw a distinction. For me, it's the focus on what's the priority, what's the available resource, what's possible for us to deliver. How can we get that value out? What, what's really important are there regulatory milestones we have to hit mm -hmm. is there a market opportunity we have to to hit right. you know, in one organization we would regularly have our fund team identify opportunities go to launch a new fund and then we would have to adapt priorities not just for that particular product but other products that were 
in process live as well so that we could manage the resource across them, manage the product backlog, manage the backlog for each of the individual products as well. Right, right. So it can be, I think, a little more complicated when you've got multiple products versus a single product. Um, but I would say that the, um, the difference between internal and external are not huge. Yeah, You're yeah. still looking at how to get the value out. What's the most important priority given the resources? What can we effectively deliver? Yeah. And I think part of the important thing that you touch on there is the fact that as a product manager, you're not necessarily focusing, even though you might be managing one product yourself and your organization might have multiple products, uh, there should be some recognition of the fact that your products oftentimes are not living in isolation. So many times if you have some sort of a feature that needs to get released to the client in one product, there can be oftentimes either constraints that you have to live by because there are other products that your product is living with, or there can be some other capabilities and other products that you might be able to leverage. So uh, I think it's important as a leader, uh, what you're demonstrating uh, for us here is the fact that you understand that product management can be much more complex than oftentimes uh, many people can think about it when they're just thinking about trying to get one single product out without really paying attention to the uh, entire portfolio of products that an organization can have. So that's a, that's a very important point there. Now, just for scenario-based uh, uh, thinking for, for ourselves, uh, I'm wondering if we can really just kind of thought, talk through about um, how we would tackle a certain initiative. So uh, let's imagine that uh, our uh, senior leadership strategic uh, at the strategic level of our organization has decided that they are going to enter uh, a new market with a new uh, line of business or a new product. Let's say we are a uh, mutual fund company or some similar company to that, and we want to get a new product, a uh, new business product out, let's say a new type of fund out. Um, and we've recognized that we may need to do some extensive work inside of our organizations to build the capability to roll this, this new product out and to support it ongoing. Can you talk to me as a uh, more senior leader about some of the things that we have to do in order to be able to roll out this uh, larger type of initiative? Sure. Um, I would say that, first of all, the, the very first thing you I would always suggest everyone does is work out exactly who the stakeholders are that need to be involved. Mm -hmm. you know, what are the different teams, you know, for a, perhaps a small isolated product, you can do that fairly isolated within a, an agile team um, and a limited number of people. But when there's a larger initiative and a, a larger product, perhaps with new processes, then we need to involve more than just a small team. Mm -hmm. So we need to understand, who from the different teams around the organization need to be involved. For example, do we need the operations team? Do we need the accounting team? Do we need the sales team? And who is the most appropriate person within those teams that need to be involved, particularly in those discussions up front, but mm -hmm. absolutely on an ongoing basis. Right. And from a product management perspective, they're going to be the, the people that I'm going to be talking with about, you know, what's the highest priority? How do we look at the backlog? What's the most important things? What are the things that we need to make sure be delivered? You know, mm -hmm. bring the compliance team in to make sure that we're hitting the regulations correctly. Right. Um, and then looking at what the needs are for each of those teams, what the impact is of this new product. Does it mean we need to change the processes? Does it mean we need to change the software? Does it mean we need to change the manual processing? And how do those pieces fit together? And what's the evolution of that? You know, how do we look at, do we need to split this into multiple phases? How do we do that phase delivery? And at which point do we need to bring the training in? Which point do we need to bring in other experts or subject matter experts in? You know, at which point are we gonna be ready to actually start working on the development of this? Mm -hmm. And what's the target date for? So a lot of different factors, but really always focusing on what's the highest priority, what's the minimum thing that we can deliver to get the value out there for this product, and how do we manage the impacts of that? Yeah. 
pulling all that together, putting the plan together, looking at the dates, what's realistic, what the impacts are of, if we need to bring more functionality in, do we need to slip the dates? Can we slip the dates? Uh, and what are the impacts? Yeah, and that's excellent. I think that really your focus on making sure that the internal resources are coordinated uh, and mobilized is a, a very important part of making sure that uh, that this type of a large initiative doesn't face any major obstacles. Because oftentimes in organizations uh, that try to do very large scale transformation or rollout changes uh, of this manner, oftentimes you'll find that you have the buy-in of many people in the organization, but you might not necessarily have the uh, buy-in of everybody in the organization. So you mentioned compliance, for example, who uh, in many organizations, in many financial institutions, the compliance organizations a lot of times uh, is stretched uh, very thinly because of the fact that the financial industry is so well regulated that compliance really needs to be on the ball and they're kind of need to be ever present in most parts of the organization. And oftentimes in those types of projects, it can be very difficult to secure the time and the resources that you need to be able to, uh, to uh, have them engage in your project to make sure that you're okay from a compliance perspective. So if you are ever in a situation where you're seeing, for example, that a very key stakeholder who uh, you need for the project is really not interested in taking part, are there some things that you can do to, to try to get uh, those folks more engaged? I think it comes back to a comment I made earlier about really understanding the stakeholders and their individual needs mm -hmm. and adapting the way that I'm interacting with them to, to get their buy-in. Mm -hmm. you know, how do I make that connection? How do I build their trust? How do I get them to understand the benefits of what we're delivering? Yes, yes people are busy, um, but it, it's working with them to try and understand how can we actually do this together? Right. You know, this isn't something for me. This, I'm here to facilitate for you. How can I make your world a better place? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And if, let's say, that is, I think, normally for most practitioners, you always want to make sure that you're taking a softer approach, showing people the benefits of doing things the right way. But oftentimes, if you're dealing with a group who really just doesn't have the buy-in or they don't have the resources, you can still run into a dead end. So do we have any tools in our tool belt? Is there any other approaches that we can use as a method of last resort if we're still not getting the resources that we want? I think it's the same with any conflict. Mm -hmm. um, and often, you know, I, I would liken conflict to the example where maybe you have um, a, a sales team that wants to deliver something which is at odds with the regulations and the compliance team. So mm -hmm. bring those heads together and facilitating that conversation. And again, I think it comes back to um, that discussion around uh, product management and prioritization. You know, as a product manager, you're going to want to bring those stakeholders together and discuss the restrictions that each of those team members have. You know, how do we manage that? What's the real priority for the organization? And mm -hmm. facilitate that discussion. You know, I've chaired change approval boards where we have to really negotiate between the teams and, and the heads and the C-level staff there. Mm -hmm. you know, what's the most important thing for the organization? Yeah. Do we have to, to take a hit in some areas in order to be able to get this greater good? Right, yeah. right. And so um, really it seems to me like your approach to this would be in making sure that there is in broad involvement, especially on a large scale initiative like this that has maybe the buy-in of the CEO of the board and of all the other senior leadership, your approach to that, it seems like would be to make sure that this is uh, broadly communicated and the leadership of the organization has the uh, obligation really to prioritize their resources in uh, one initiative versus another one. So I think that that's typically the approach in many organizations where when you have senior leadership, oftentimes you need to get access to either the senior vice president or the CEO themselves to, 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 to make sure that they uh, are really very clear about their, uh, about their own priorities. So I think that that's, a, that's a, a, an approach that works very well in, in, in many organizations.
And so uh, in terms of the questions that I, I wanted to go through, I think I've, I've learned uh, everything about your background and your profile and I have a good sense uh, for what you're capable of doing. Uh, is there anything else that you would like for us to discuss? Uh, well, I, I think, um, you know, first of all, I'd like to say thank you because I think this is a great initiative and it's a great way of sharing uh, experiences. Uh, mm -hmm. Part of what's important for me is continually learning. Absolutely. Looking at different things to pick up. And I think this is a great way of, of making knowledge more available to the wider audience. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. And I want to thank you because uh, I think that the perspective that many of our junior or aspiring professionals are lacking are the perspective of senior leaders who've really been uh, on the ground in the, at the implementation level. So I uh, appreciate you spending the time with us to impart some of your knowledge uh, in, in, in helping the more junior members of our community really understand uh, how things are viewed by, by uh, the leadership of, of organizations. Absolutely. I mean, I think there's, doesn't matter how well you're doing something, there's always a better way. Yeah. Yeah. And to our audience members, I will be leaving contact information uh, for Simon. So uh, please feel free to reach out to uh, Simon and connect with them uh, for, for anything that you want. Uh, and I want to thank you again, Simon, for appearing on the show and uh, imparting your very valuable knowledge. And we'll be in touch. Thanks. And have a great day. Take care.